heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. How great is our God. Would you stand, please? <laughs>
that for who you are. How great you are. Thank you for your love and compassion. Thank you for going to the cross for somebody such as I. Help us please, God, that we would always give you our best, that we would be the witness, that we would tell others about who you are and what you've done for us. Please be with Mike now as he brings us to the word. May we honor you and give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen. All right, thank you, Brother Danny. Take your Bibles if you've got them. Or if you got it on your phone, take a minute, if you would please, and turn to the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 7. Joshua, chapter 7. And if you're not sure where that is, it's the sixth book from the beginning of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, chapter 7. Now, as you're turning to Joshua, chapter 7, when you get there, drop down to verse 24. But I want you to remember this as we're reading this Old Testament passage of Scripture. The best commentary on the Bible is? All right. Now, Paul said about Old Testament passages, people, and events, the things that were written before, he's talking about Old Testament things, were written for our learning and to be an example to us. Now, a lot of people think that when you look at the Old Testament book of Joshua, that you're looking at an Old Testament um, application or uh, illustration of the promised land. The people of God, God had delivered them for 400 years of bondage and captivity. They have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, but they have entered the promised land. But you've got to understand this. When you're reading the Old Testament book of Joshua, and God's people entering Canaan, it's not about us entering heaven. It's about God's people entering the life that God saved them to possess. Joshua is an object lesson for the Christian life. For example, in Canaan, the promised land, in the book of Joshua, there were battles to be fought. There were strongholds to be taken. In heaven, there'll be no battles to be, to be fought. There'll be no enemy strongholds to be taken. God's people won't sin and mess up in heaven, but they did sometimes in the book of Joshua. Now, I want us to read chapter 7, verses 24 through 26, and keep your Bible open because we're going to look back a little earlier and some things that happened before this. It's good to be here. Some of my favorite people to preach to. and We've been preaching around, been several places recently, but we're glad to be here. Joshua 7, let's look at verse 24 through 26. And then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the gold, the robe, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all of Israel stoned him. And after they stoned the rest... That means everyone with him, everyone in his household. It says they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remain to this day. And then the Lord turned from his fierce anger, and therefore that place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. Now, according to what we just read, Joshua chapter 7, a man by the name of Achan, his family and all that he possessed, everything he had, were marched outside the camp of Israel into a valley. 
And there in this valley, the Israelites began to pick up stones. Not pebbles, not gravel, large stones. Stones that were large enough to kill you if they were thrown with enough force. And with these stones, the people of God killed Achan and all that belonged to him. Now, after they stoned Achan and all of his household, they burned their bodies. But when there was nothing left of them but ashes, they stacked more stones on top of the ashes. Now, what in the world was going on? What had Achan done? Who was this guy that the people of God killed him and all that were related to him? Was he a spy? that had infiltrated the ranks of Israel and been found out? Was he a terrorist? Was he a pagan, an idolater, a heathen man? What had Achan done that was so awful that this gruesome death of he and his family, even his livestock, was not only permitted by God, it was commanded by God. Some folks think God doesn't work that way. Listen to me, folks. The answer to why what happened to him happened to him at God's command is found in verses 20 and 21 of Joshua 7. Let's read those, if you would, please. And Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder, what's the plunder? It's the plunder of Jericho. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. I hid them in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Now watch this. Achan was not a captured spy. He was not an enemy of the people of God. Achan was an Israelite, one of the people of God. He had been a soldier in the army of God. He had been a part of the invading force that had taken the huge enemy stronghold called Jericho. You remember the story of Jericho? It's not just a VBS story for children. It is fact. It is not fiction. It's not fable. It is not fairy tale. After 40 years, or 440 years of wandering in the wilderness, the people of God had finally entered the promised land. The land and the life that God had saved them to possess. But the enemy had a stronghold in Canaan that the people of God had to take and its name was the city of Jericho. God had given strange instructions through Joshua to the people of God. He said, this is the way you do it. You march around the city of Jericho once a day for six days. On the seventh day, I want you to march around Jericho seven times. And after you have marched around Jericho seven times, you're going to hear a long and loud trumpet blast. When you hear the trumpet blast, you are to shout. Folks, there's another trumpet blast coming. 
And it'll be shouting time. I promise you that. But God said, when you shout, the walls of Jericho are going to collapse and you are to go in and take the city. But look what God's instructions were to them once they got in. Look at chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. And on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. Verse 16. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. But only Rahab, the prostitute, and all that are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent earlier. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. Now look at verse 19. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and they must go into his treasury. God had given the command that every living thing in Jericho be destroyed except for Rahab and her family because she had hidden Israeli spies that had gone over to check them out. Now watch this. But Israel was commanded by the Lord God himself, you are not to plunder Jericho. You're not to take any of the valuables for yourself. All of the silver, all of the gold, all of the bronze of Jericho, that is to be devoted and given to God, brought to the treasury of the Lord. Now, when Achan marched in to Jericho with the people of God, some things caught his eye. Chapter 7, look at verse 1. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, the things God said you don't touch and you don't take. So Achan took some of them and the Lord's anger burned against him. Now, Achan took a Babylonian robe, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold. Now here comes the sermon. You may not have me back after this. <laughs> I done preached it to myself in the barn this morning. If these things that happened before have been preserved in the Word of God for us to learn from, what do we learn from what we've just read? Number one, sin is easy to commit. You ought to write it down in the margin of your Bible. Look at verse 21. Achan says, when I saw the silver, the gold, the robe, he said, I coveted them. Let me ask you a question. Who helped Achan take them? Who was with him? Who influenced him, poked him with their elbow and said, look at that stuff. Do you see that? They won't miss it. No one helped him. No one talked him into it. Achan took it on his own, and he sinned on his own. And if you'll examine the text, the devil is nowhere mentioned. So this deal, well, the devil's really working on me, 
That doesn't cut it. Because the truth is, the devil is nowhere mentioned in the text. You know why? Because Achan did wrong on his own and you quit blaming the devil for everything in your life that you do wrong. James 1 verse 14. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. He's dragged away and enticed. And you'll do wrong and you'll sin with the devil not being within a hundred miles of you. Watch this. Achan does wrong without any help. Nowhere in the account, the biblical record, does the scripture say this, that he had a wagon, that he had a wheelbarrow, that he had a cart to take these things. You know why? He didn't need them. Watch. The silver weighed five pounds. The wedge of gold weighed less than two pounds. That's easy to take. That's easy to sneak out. That uh, Babylonian robe, he could have folded it up and just tucked it away. It was easy for him to take what he took. It was a busy, hectic time, and no one was looking. Yes, there was. Now watch this. He grabs these forbidden things and leaves. Now folks, listen to me. That's the way sin is for us. It is easy to commit. You need proof? You could have sinned some sins sitting here this morning. And nobody knows about it but you and the Lord. Man, you could have lusted after some woman here today when she walked past your row. Because you can sin, folks, with just a thought. Am I right? Now watch this. You can sin with a thought. We can sin with a look. Sin is easy to commit. In this day and time in which we live, you can sin by just clicking a button Click. on a computer mouse when you're there by yourself and nobody sees it. Now watch this. We know that we can sin with words. We know that we can sin with actions. But we can sin with our attitudes. Nobody knows it. Now watch this. Sin is so easy to commit that you can sin by not doing anything. You want proof? The Bible says this, anyone that knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Am I right? I'm scaring some of you new folks to death already. Now watch. You'd be there at the gas station. And it's just you and this guy one-on-one. -on -one, and the Spirit of God is saying, witness to me. Bring up my name. Invite him to church. And you don't do it. He that knows the good he ought to and doesn't do it, sins. You see this? Is this any good? It gets better. Sin is easy to commit. Number two, sin is impossible to conceal. That's what we learn from Achan. Now watch this. Now listen to me, sir. You can be doing something, involved in something, and your wife has no clue about that. You can sin against your husband. You can sin against your wife. You could sin against your kids. Listen to me. And they not even know it. That's going on in your life. You can sin and the preacher not know it. 
The Sunday school teacher not know it. The song leader not know it. People at your church not know it. Because sin is so easy to commit. But it is impossible to conceal. Because irregardless of how many around you don't know about it, God knows all about it. I preached it by a former church in St. Louis, and uh, it's in Arnold, just south of South County. Auditorium seats about 1,700 people. I wasn't a pastor. I was a staff member there. I preached a lot, though. But back in the 90s, we invited Jerry Johnson to come to our church. He had just written a book entitled um, The Rise of Satanism. Oh, it's called The Edge of Evil, The Rise of Satanism in North America. He had taken on Paul Valentine, who was a head of the satanic church in America on CNN. I'm not a CNN fan, and you shouldn't be either. But Jerry Johnson had debated the head of the church of Satan on CNN. We invited, in fact, I invited Jerry Johnson to come and speak at our church on a Wednesday night. And we put it out in the area, and the auditorium was packed. TV stations from St. Louis came out to interview Jerry Johnston. Now, Jerry Johnston, in talking about the edge of evil and the rise of Satanism in North America, he said this. He was in a church in Alaska, and there was a woman in the service that was obviously demon-oppressed or demon-possessed. And if you think that's not real... You better read your Bible. He and the pastor and a couple of other men had taken this lady back to the pastor's office to talk with her and to counsel her. As they talked with her, she began to speak in this voice that was unrecognizable. It was from way down low and gravelly and gruff. And as they began to pray for her, This woman looks at the pastor, and this voice inside of her said, You have no power over me. I know what you've been doing. She said that to the pastor. Evidently, he'd been doing some stuff that he knew about. And the devil and the demons knew about it. And they said, you have no power over me. I know what you've been up to. Now, folks, some of us, may have some things going on in our lives that are hidden from everyone. I got news for you. They're not hidden from God. And they will rob you of spiritual power in your life. We don't know the timetable involved between ache and taking the wedge of gold, the silver, and that fancy robe. We don't know how long before it all came out. Achan may have thought, and he probably did, that he'd gotten away with it because nobody knew. The scripture says he has hidden this stuff under the floor of his tent. He brought this junk into his house. He slept with it hidden there. He talked with it hidden there. He visited with people with this stuff hidden there. Every time a family member walked in that tent or a friend came over and they walked on the floor of that tent, 
Achan knew what was hiding underneath their feet. He was an Israeli. He was a soldier in the army of God. He was a religious man who worshipped the living God, the God of the Bible, the God of creation, the God of salvation. And maybe, being this very religious man, he may have even prayed in that tent with that stuff hidden there. Maybe he had his family together and they're going to ask the Lord's blessing on the meal. And his kids bow their heads and his wife. And while he's praying, he knows there's stuff hidden that they don't know about. Maybe at night, when he kissed his kids on the forehead and told them good night. Everybody thought he's a really good man. He's a really religious man. Man, he, he's a soldier in the army of God. He took on the enemy. Man, he was part of the raiding force, the invading force, Jericho. But it, listen to me. People didn't know what was hidden in his tent. Be that way in our lives, isn't it? We can put up a good show. Hey, I'm fat, but I look pretty good. I'm happy with that. I'm just seeing if you're awake. But you don't know what's inside of me. You don't know what's going on in the secret place. But I got news for you. There's someone who does know. And I can't hide anything from him. And neither can you. Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Achan was going to give an account for that hidden stuff. You're probably wishing you'd ask Larry to preach this morning, aren't you? <laughs> Look at verses 10 through 12 in chapter 7. And the Lord said to Joshua, Stand up! What are you doing on your face? Then God's going to reveal what happened. Verse 11, chapter 7. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Verse 12. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. See that? They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. Now watch this. God said, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Now watch. The Israelites had defeated huge Jericho, marched around it once every day, six days, march around it seven times on the seventh day. They hear the priests blow the trumpets. They shout, the walls come down, they take in, and they win big time. Now, down the road is another enemy stronghold, but it's just a little bitty town, a little bitty place, and its name's not Jericho, its name is Ai. Israelites had defeated mighty Jericho, but watch this. They go to this little bitty runt of a place and they get whooped bad. 
God said the reason for their defeat was because of the secret sin in the camp. You see, what Achan thought was concealed, God revealed. Look at verses 14 and 15 in chapter 7. In the morning, God says, present yourselves tribe by tribe. And the tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come forward man by man. And he who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him, he has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. My goodness. God exposed it. Now, you remember our outline? You need to remember the text more than my outline, but the outline is this. Sin is easy to commit, but sin is impossible to conceal. God's going to reveal it, and God's going to deal with it. Well, I don't like that kind of preaching, Brother Mike. Neither does the devil. While sin is easy to commit and it's impossible to conceal, number three, it is certain to cost. What's that old cliche? Sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go, keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and costs you more than you wanted to spend. What did Achan's secret sin cost him? Watch. It cost him God's power in his life and God's protection. Number two, it cost him his family because sometimes we think we sin in a vacuum. Well, that's just my business, Brother Mike, and you just need to stay out. That's just between me and the Lord. I got news for you. Nobody sins in a vacuum. It affected his entire family. And his children even suffered because of it. Wow. That's the way sin is. Sometimes even the innocent suffer. Watch this. His sin caused his life to be shortened. I bring my kids to your house when they're little. They're all grown up now. But if I brought them to your house and they act up and they won't straighten up, first of all, I'm going to tell them to stop it. If that doesn't get their attention, I may just reach down and pop them on that good spot that God gave them. If they won't heed my word and they won't heed my discipline, then I may just pick them up and take them back home because they're going to destroy your things and damage my reputation. First John, there is a sin unto death. And I wonder how many of God's people, their lives have been shortened because they got out doing wrong and God spoke to them, but they didn't listen. And God disciplined them, but they didn't turn around. So God said, I got to take them home. Because they're going to damage my reputation. If people see them and think that's what a Christian is. And that's the way a Christian acts. Are you with me here? Now think about this. Achan's sin caused him or cost him all those things. But it caused him to damage his witness and his testimony. I've never heard one positive sermon on Achan, and I've been preaching for a long time. 
You know how long ago this happened? 1,400 years before Jesus came and walked this earth. That means this is 1,600 plus years old and we're still talking about it. Preaching it, teaching it, studying it, learning from it. Aiken's testimony and witness has been destroyed. Because of what he did. His sin affected not just he and his family. Watch this. People lost their lives because of Achan's sin. When God allowed, or when God sent his people to Jericho when they won this big victory, then they go into Ai. And God allows them to suffer a terrible defeat. Do you know how many Israelis lost their lives at Ai? Because of Achan? Because of what he did? 36 men. How many wives was that? How many kids did they have? How many grandkids did they have? Achan's sin cost a whole lot of good people to die. Wouldn't it be a, something and awful if there are some people in our lives that could be saved? But our sin is keeping it from happening. And they're going to perish. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covers his sin shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsakes shall receive mercy. The church has got more than it's ever had in its history. We've got more personnel Preachers with masters of divinity degrees and earned doctorates. We've got more trained personnel we've ever had. We've got more property than we've ever had. Church owns billions and billions of dollars worth of buildings and properties all over this world, all over this country. We've got more programs than we've ever had before. We got all, we've got single programs. Couples programs, youth programs, music programs, Sunday school programs, senior programs, mission programs. But while the church has all that, there's one thing the church doesn't have. We've got personnel trained, educated. We've got property. And we've got programs, but we don't have any power. Maybe why? Maybe it's because there is too much hidden sin, not in the camp, but in the church. Ooh. I'll quit. The dangers of sin, it's easy to commit. But it's impossible to conceal because God sees and God knows. And it's going to cost us more than we ever realized. Would you stand to your feet, please? Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word and the great privilege that has been mine for a lot of years to stand in front of a people and open the Bible, the inerrant, the infallible, the inspired word of God, and tell the people what you have to say. Father, I pray that we would take sin serious and learn from the example of Achan and what we've seen and studied today. God, have your way in this invitation. In Jesus' name, I pray.
Amen. Achan confessed what he did, but he confessed when he got caught. We don't know what would have happened if he'd come clean earlier. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but he didn't come clean. He didn't want to. I'm sure he'd been embarrassed and humiliated. A lot of folks won't come forward in a church. They're embarrassed and humiliated. Folks, if we're going to have any spiritual power in our lives and in our church, we've got to deal with the sin problem. Today, if you're here and you've never turned from your sins and turned to Jesus, I want you to know this. You can never pay for your sins, not one. And eternity in hell will not pay for one of your sins. Jesus paid for them on the cross in full with his body and his blood. And having paid for our sins in full and died in our place, because that's what our sin deserved, he rose from the dead. Now listen, if you've never turned to Jesus as the only Savior, one of these days you're going to pay for your sins. But today, listen to me, if you'll come to Jesus and call out to him to save you, Bow your life to his lordship. I promise you this. He'll save you. He'll give you a new life and a new start. A new family and a new future. But I know who I'm speaking to this morning. This, this was all about the people of God. Listen to me. Our hidden sins, folks, are going to cost us. And they're going to cost us. Victory and power in our lives and in our church. I'm not your pastor. But if you've been coming to the church and you've been thinking about joining the church and wanting to be a part, there's about three ways you, need, you can join a church. Number one, you come and be saved. Make a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus. Follow him, believers, baptism, unite with the church. Number two, if you are already a member of a church, a Baptist church or a Bible-believing church, you can come. Maybe that church is no longer in existence. You can come by a statement saying, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I was baptized biblically by immersion. And I want to come and unite with this church. You could come by transfer of letter, which means you're a member of another a sister church, and you come and just say, I want to transfer my membership from there to here. They'll deal with that. The folks in the church will deal with that. But listen to me. The main thing, folks, is today. If you've never been saved from your sins, there's only one way. And that is this, to come, to come. Acknowledge that you're a sinner and separated from God, and Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all on the cross to recon reconcile you to God. Ray tells me this all the time, and I just didn't think about it just now. He said, Brother Mike, he said, what used to be sin is not sin anymore. Well, I know what he means. It still is, but we don't call it what it is anymore, in it? Folks, understand this. The dangers of sin in the lives of God's people. That's the, that's the lesson here. As we sing, the altar's open, you come. I'll help you if I can. There'll be others here who will. But you come as God leads and we sing. Brother Danny, lead us, would you please?